Y'all came yeah. here to see fantastic Adam Goodwitz, which means I'm going to do a lot of talking for a long period of time before he can even speak. I think they came here to see fantastic Dave Eggers, actually. Oh, um, that's true. But <laughs> sorry, everybody. I can answer questions for him, too. Okay. Pretend you're Dave Eggers. <laughs> okay. No. Here, I want to give a little context, because what Adam specializes in, what he is so very good at, is he brings fairy tales and folk tales to new life for kids in a way that nobody else has really done in the same way. And I want to give just a little background on fairy tales and folk tales and what it meant to librarians. Because we always talk about, well, this, these days people are finally trying to get more diverse books into the classrooms, into our, in, in our children's hands. And that is magnificent. I should say that librarians have been trying to do this for a very long time. All the way back to Anne Carol Moore, back at the days of NYPL. But how did they try to get diverse books, they tried to get folk tales from around the world. That was what she tried to do. She had all these immigrants coming into New York City, and she was like, let's have fairy tales and folk tales from the countries that they're from, and then we can have just like world folk tales. So if you go to any like children's library that is, has any sort of history to it, you'll see the big 398.2 fairy tale folk tale section. It's gigantic. Remember when the publishers used to publish just tons of those? And then these days, I think maybe I could count 10 uh, came out this year. So, you know, the number really, really went down. There were a number of reasons that why fairy tales and folk tales aren't being published quite as much these days. But what we have is we have people like Adam, um, we have a bunch of people who are sort of reinterpreting them in different formats. And so I wanted to sort of ask you why you do that and why you put them into these different formats the way that you do. Because you do it in both the Unicorn Society and you also do it in the Tale Dark and Grim and you do it on your new podcast. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a great question. Before I um, answer your question, I have two things that I want to say quickly. First, um, being here in New York and in Brooklyn, I would just like to um, acknowledge uh, the Lenape people, specifically the Canarsie tribe. This was their territory and has been for thousands of years, and I just would like to acknowledge them. Um, and the second thing that I would like to do, yes, for them. The second thing I would like to do is just say that I feel a little bit like a fraud up here because there's all these like um, big lights and people taking photos and an hour ago I was covered in baby poop um, <laughs> and desperately trying to get out of the house and my daughter was screaming in my face and now I'm like, no, I'm up here talking to Betsy Bird looking fancy. Uh, so uh, I'm not fancy, I'm just pretending. Um, okay, what was the question? Oh yes, fairy tales. Why do I tell fairy tales? Um, so I was uh, as a, t a teacher, as you said, and um, one year um, I had... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll bridge the story because I know we don't have a ton of time, but um, I was teaching and I t wrote a, a book for uh, my second graders um, and I read it to them every one chapter a night for uh, over the course of a year. At the end of the school year, I quit my job um, as a teacher and tried to get the book published. I worked on it for a year. I sent it to an agent. Um, she said, this is bad. Um, at, and so I was uh, sitting there with like, you know, a book that she, no one would publish and no job um, and feeling very upset. And I went, um, my, I was substituting in my school to make some extra cash and one day they called me up and asked me if I'd be willing to be a substitute librarian for a day and I was like yes because librarian is one of the best jobs I can imagine you get to I really true as, you know as a school librarian you get to hang out with children and share stories that you like with children I know these days they make you do like technology and all that other stuff but as a substitute I was like I just have to tell stories to kids let me do that so they said great you're gonna be telling stories to second graders I said no problem they said tell them any story you want I said great so I went home and I was looking on my shelf for a good story to read to second graders. And I came across, I, I'm not sure if it's the right slide yet, but yeah, that book. This is my book of the real grim fairy tales. Now I had never read that book before, so I looked at it and I thought, oh, fairy tales, those are perfect for little kids. <laughs> so I opened it up to a story called Faithful Johannes. And in the story Faithful Johannes, as some of you know, two children get their heads cut off by their parents. And I read that and I was like, uh, that's interesting. Um, can I read this to second graders? Uh, will I get fired? Um, and then I thought, let's find out. <laughs> so I brought the book in and I started reading it to these kids. Um, and very quickly they started to get very nervous. So I made a joke to calm them down or I started to warn them and really bad things were going to happen. And I think I did a pretty good job because by the end of the story I looked up and every kid had the same expression on his face. Every kid looked exactly like this, like. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh boy. So I dismissed the children, some of them were crying. But one little girl came up to me, and I'll never forget it. She stuck her finger in my face, and she goes, that was good. And I was like, what? And she goes, you should make that into a book. And I thought, huh, maybe I should. So I went home, and I wrote that story down exactly the way I told it to those kids, with all the jokes, 
all the warnings right in the story. And I sent that to the agent instead of the Ancient Egypt book. Um, and she called me up and she said, this is pretty good. And she became my agent, and that became the first chapter of my first book, A Tale Dark and Grim. Um, so yes, a second grader told me to become a writer, or to write this way, and, and without her, I would not have followed this path. So when I'm writing these fairy tales, I think that the key for me in retelling them is a lot, they were funny, um, but the, a lot of the humor doesn't work anymore. And so recasting the humor without losing the depth of the emotions and the scariness of them. I'm not going to speak badly about Chris Colfer's Land of Stories, even though he totally stole my title for his grim reminder or whatever. What are you talking about? Come on, man. <laughs> um, but what I try to do is I try to respect um, what was great, what made the fairy tales eternal, which is those dark emotions. But I try to make sure that they still have the humor that they would have probably had back then for a modern audience um, so kids can really get them. That's sort of my approach. That's great. And you can get a lot of that on that podcast of yours, yes, Grim, exactly. Grim, Grimmest, because I love that podcast. Thank and you. And my kids are big fans, of actually, of that podcast really? as well, because you do the same thing. And you do it so well. You've got the kids who are listening um, that you're interacting with. So you're hearing kids, like, reacting to things throughout the podcast. But you've also got actors reading parts of the thing. And then it kind of flips between you reading parts as well. So you've got the voice of the actors doing the characters. You've got yourself. And then you've got the kids interjecting, being like, like, what? Like, yeah, my favorite interjection. So, so I did that because for the last 10 years since that story I told you, as a writer, I've been traveling to schools, as many of you know. I've probably been to some of your schools and um, book festivals telling these grim fairy tales. And the kids' reactions are the best part. So I really wanted to capture that. And so when a podcast company called Pinna approached me and said, you have a podcast idea, I said, oh, my gosh, yes. Um, and so we took mics into the classroom, and I told the stories live to the kids, and they reacted. And then we produced it. And you got just great reactions. There, there are amazing moments where, like, um, in Rumpelstiltskin, I think it is, the father promises... Um, no, 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 in Hans My Hedgehog, um, the uh, king promises his daughter as a, as a wife. Um, and I say, is that fair, that a king just promises his girl to somebody? And all the kids go, no, except one boy goes, yeah. And I was like, what? And this boy says, like, He's the king. He's her dad. And I was like, that's interesting. This is all on the podcast. Um, can, uh, what if your mom promised you to somebody and said, came home one day and said, you have to marry this girl that you've never met before? Would that be fair? And he goes, no. <laughs> and I was like, well, then is it fair for the king to do it to his daughter? And he goes, oh. You know, it's amazing. boys are just dumb. We are dumb. As you've, if you've heard the news recently, boys are better than, we're stupider than girls. You, we are, you're much better than we are. But um, uh, it's just the, the things that we catch on, on the podcast. And then one last thing I have to tell you about the one thing we caught on the podcast was um, in the last episode, which is coming out in two days, we're dropping one a day through Halloween. The last episode of the first season is a story called um, The Water of Life. And in The Water of Life, there is a blue dwarf. And I'm telling the kids about the blue dwarf. Prince is coming to the forest, he sees a blue dwarf, and I hear this kid goes, you mean a smurf? <laughs> and I was like, it's not a smurf, it's a dwarf. And, and another kid goes, I'm pretty sure that's a smurf. <laughs> <laughs> and then they like heckle me for the rest of the episode. It's excellent. Anyway. Yeah, and it kind of avoids the whole kids say the darndest things. It doesn't have that cutesy vibe to it. It's just honestly just kids like reacting, which is much, much better. Yeah, yeah. pretty amazing. Now, I talked about how librarians would collect folktales and bring them together, and that was great, except that a lot of these folktales were written by white authors who would take the things from other cultures and then write them themselves. So you got very few fairy tales or folktales from people from those cultures. Um, and that continued for a very long time until recently people have been like, perhaps we should have people who actually are from these cultures writing these stories. Would that be a good idea? Yes, it would actually be a very, very good idea. Good idea. Yes, it would. So we've also been seeing people making big mistakes about this kind of appropriation. Um, I don't know if y'all recall when J.K. Rowling decided that she was going to have wizarding schools in other parts of the world, and she decided there would be a wizarding school that was Native American. That went down real great. Um, it did not. Watch the trailer sometime and then look at some of the comments that people made about this. She didn't do any research. She didn't reach out to anybody from, I think there was one in Africa. She didn't reach out to anybody from any specific like country there. 
she was just sort of saying like, yeah, we're gonna have wizarding schools and here's what they would consist of. And people were like, hello, um, person who's just walking into these different cultures. That's not great. Rick Reardon, on the other hand, has started an entire new series where he's got people, um, he's got you know, an Indian, uh, a woman from, you know, who is Indian American writing about um, Hindu mythology, and it's Aru Shaw, and it's so great. good. Really it's good. so great. So he, got, he started to say, I'm going to lend my name, but these are the authors of these books. These are their worlds, these are their tellings. When you write the Unicorn Society books, you the next are morning, now. The king came in. Oh wait, sorry, oh. that was that, that was a little. Oh, uh, that's sorry, that's really good. <laughs> You'll have to go download the podcast yourself if you want to hear a little Darn. bit of it. There's Unicorn Star Society. So yes. yeah, the Unicorn Society. So you have been. Um, yeah, I think you started out. You you have been co-writing them, but you've been co-writing them. So for example, with Joseph Bruchak. Yeah. For example. Yeah. Um, for this one. So what what was the whole background idea with doing this? So you know, it didn't start that way. Um, uh, and it started, the book series, Unicorn Rescue Society, started just as a series. You know, as, as a teacher, um, I had this experience, and as many of you being school librarians, I think you have had too, where I would be walking students through um, a library, and I would say, like, are you, you know, what do you want to read? Let's, let's choose a book to read. And they would say, I don't know what I want to read. And I'd be like, okay, what about Matilda? And they would say, no. And I would say, okay, what about Harry Potter? And they would say, no. And I would say, you know, uh, what about a Jacqueline Woodson book? No. What about anything? You know, I'm just trying to, Magic Treehouse? No. Othello? No. Game of Thrones? Read something. You know, Fifty Shades of Grey? I don't care. Just read. And they wouldn't read. And the only time that they would say yes to anything was usually if it was a series and it was funny. Um, and if it was a boy, it had to be about boys because, as I said, boys are worse than girls. Um, but if it was, about, if it was uh, a girl, then a girl could read about anything, but she preferred if there were animals in it. So I was thinking, okay, I'm thinking about my second graders and thinking about um, a series that I could write for that kid, that kid really for the school librarian and the teacher who has to walk that kid through the stacks. Um, and so I came up with the Unicorn Rescue Society. And... To be honest, um, I'm, I'm very proud of all of these books, but my thought process has been just as slow as a lot of the white folks in our industry. My first thought was, okay, it was, when I first had the idea for the series, it was, We Need Diverse Books had just sort of come onto the scene under that name. You know, obviously we've needed diverse books for a very long time, but that movement had just begun. And so I thought, yeah, well, I had a wonderful student named Uchenna, um, and why don't I make her one of the stars of the book? And I love Uchenna, and I wrote to Uchenna, and she read the book, and she loves her character, and she was very excited to be featured. And that's great. And for both the first book and the second book, um, I worked really closely with experts from the local um, places where the kids go. So the series, in case you don't know what it's about, two children and their eccentric mentor travel around the world rescuing mythical creatures from danger. And each book, they go to a new location and they meet um, local folks, they learn about the culture, they learn about the language, they learn about the mythology, and then they use what they've learned to help the local people save a mythical creature. The first book is a Jersey Devil, and Jersey, as you can see, the little blue guy becomes their sidekick, and they go to the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. The second book, they go to the Basque country. So we worked with uh, local experts in the Basque country, um, uh, and then, and of course, in the Pine Barrens, we worked with... Um, uh, representatives of the Delaware tribe, because we talk a little bit about the um, uh, Native American population of the Pine Barrens. But then, um, and I, you know, felt like, okay, that was good, that good job, Adam. Um, patting myself on the back, very typical, like, mediocre white man move, like, yeah, I did great, because I did something. Um, and then, um, as the We Need Diverse Books um, uh, movement uh, evolved, people started, as, as Betsy pointed out, being like, hold on, white folks. You don't just get to write books with our people in them and say, like, oh, now we have diversity, right? That's not good enough. And I was at a, I was at a conference um, of, of um, authors, just author conference, and um, a brilliant author of color was explaining this. And I was like, wow, I'm, I'm an idiot. And it's not that I'm an idiot, but I have grown up in a system that has privileged whiteness and has privileged maleness for my whole life. I grew up in a country where um, black people have been enslaved and kept down, a system that was made to keep brown and Asian people working for white people, a system that was made to erase indigenous people and to keep women silent. And I have benefited from that for my whole life. Um, my parents bought a house um, in Baltimore when I was growing up, the house I grew up in, and on the deed it said, 
um, you shall not sell this house to blacks or Jews. My parents are Jewish, and they were like, is this okay? And they were like, don't worry about it. But there were no black people in my neighborhood. So I have, you know, I walk into a room, and I'm like a tall, able-bodied white man, and I get instant credibility. So I've benefited from this for my whole life. So yeah, I'm going to keep doing stuff like that. I'm going to keep being blind to things. I'm going to keep saying things that are sexist and racist. I'm embarrassed about my sexism and my racism, but I was born and bred with it, and I will keep making mistakes like that. So the first two books in the series are not mistakes. They're great. They're really, really great books, but we realized we could do even better. So starting with the third book, I started reaching out to authors from the cultures that uh, from other cultures. I didn't decide what cultures we were going to reach out for. I just found authors that I really loved their work and like prayed and hoped that they would want to work with me. So I once heard, heard Joseph Bruchak, legendary Native American author and storyteller, tell a story at a New York State uh, Reading Association conference. And I was like, that is the best storyteller I think I've ever heard in my whole life. And so I wrote to him and I said, Joe, would you be willing to write a book like this with me? And he was excited to do it. So we wrote um, Sasquatch and the Muckleshoot, which takes place on the Muckleshoot Reservation in Washington State. We worked very closely with them, with their language experts. Um, and Joe, being Native American himself, had a lot um, in common with them. Book four is co-written by David Bowles. David Bowles is a name that I think people are starting to know. And if you don't know it yet, you should know it. Oh, I've got photos here. So, oh, sorry. That's, that's my co creator, um, Jesse. That's us when we were in seventh grade, just in case you want to see. Um, so I've been working with Jesse since we were kids together. Um, but, um, and that's uh, Chris, uh, and that's a video. We're not going to show the video right now. I know you all want to watch a cartoon, but not right now. Um, I'm going to come back to Hatem. He's the illustrator. He's amazing. I don't want to forget to come back to Hatem, but just so you have photos of the people that I'm talking about when I'm talking. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. Um, so jo Joseph Bruchak, here we go. There's Joe. Nope, there's Joe and his wonderful books. Two Roads, I just finished two days ago. is so, so good. Please read Two Roads. Um, it's about the Indian residential schools, about a creek boy, and how it interacts with the uh, Hoover towns in the Great Depression. Um, very pertinent to right now. Uh, so Two Roads by Joseph Bruchak. So the next author is David Bowles. Um, who is an amazing author. He's got a series, Garza Twins, which is kind of like Percy Jackson, but with Aztec mythology. Jo um, David is a Mexican-American author and a scholar of Aztec mythology. Um, he's, his books are awesome. And I highly recommend his new book of poetry, They Call Me Guero, um, is already um, garnering rave reviews. I don't even think it's out yet. Um, so the fourth book I'm writing with David, and we're writing about... Um, uh, a young chupacabra who is separ separated from his family by the construction of a border wall on the border between Texas and Mexico. Um, so uh, I wouldn't have been able to take on that issue, and I certainly wouldn't have done a good job of taking on that issue without David. So David has been an unbelievable. And we're actually launching the cover of Chupacabras in the, of the Rio Grande uh, tomorrow on Latinx uh, in Kidlet. So check out uh, Latinos in Kidlet's Latinx in Kidlet website tomorrow. Um, and Emma Otegi, I'm writing the fifth book with. Uh, Emma is from Cuba. She has a book coming out in April, May, called Silver Meadows Summer, which is amazing, a, a novel. Um, and so we're writing about uh, Cuba together. And then the sixth book, I'm writing with Hannah Khan, who is the author of Ominous Voice, as you guys know, which is a, she's so great. So all of these authors have just made the series. I really think the first two books are fun and great. I really stand by them. I love them. But they have made the series much, much better, deeper and richer. Um, and I'm just very grateful that they were willing to write uh, with me on the series. Fantastic. Yeah. So we're out of time. What? Uh, oh, my <laughs> God. I talked so long. What about the Dave Egger questions? Oh, I didn't even get to them. So, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. You won't be able to hear his Dave Egger answers. But they're so that's good. Okay. They're much better than Dave's. I could just talk to you all freaking day anyway. So I can't. You guys have an incredibly full lineup of things that you have to do today as well. But put your hands together and thank Adam Gidwitz. Thank you guys for being, for being here. here.